Hey, before we get into today's episode of Comics Are Dope, a couple of things. Um, clearly, you saw from the title that today I'm talking to Tad Stones, the creator of one of my childhood heroes, Darkwing Duck. And this conversation was in support of the Darkwing Duck Kickstarter um, from Dynamite Entertainment. There are three graphic novels that you can grab in oversized deluxe hardcover or in trade paperback editions. Now, as you're listening to this, you're going to hear us reference the fact that you've only got hours left to back. And that was true. The main campaign did end on July 3rd. But at the time of this intro recording on July 10th, 2024, they are allowing for late pledges. So consider this your last warning. I have no idea how long they're going to be accepting pledges. But if you want to get the Darkwing Duck hardcovers, you can go to comicsordope.com slash Darkwing and make your pledge. Get those last orders in because when they're gone, they're gone. And now let's talk to Tad Stones. Well, guys, today's guest probably needs no introduction. I feel like we say that a lot, um, but... <laughs> But this man has had an acclaimed career, uh, writing, story editing, producing, directing, TV and film animation. Um, he's responsible for such works as Hercules, the animated series. You might know Chippendale's Rescue Rangers, or I don't know if you're watching this, maybe you're familiar with uh, a certain Drake Mallard or Darkwing Duck. And of course, uh, here to talk about Darkwing Duck is his creator. Mr. Tad Stones, welcome to the show. Hey, happy to be here. I'm excited to have you. Um, so, I, I, I always like to, I, I got to say, I always point out, or I try to point out, mm -hmm. that by WGA rules, Writers Guild Association, because mm -hmm. I was a showrunner and the initial idea guy and all that, I'm definitely classified as the creator. But really, it took my whole crew and obviously the talents of Jim. Uh, Cummings and you know my writers, my story editors, my voice caster, and all that. It take it does take a village to make a cartoon, and uh, those were these prime days of the Disney afternoon. And we had great teams, and I was lucky that my team kind of moved from one of my shows to another, mm -hmm. and uh, we all, everybody brought new stuff to Darkwing Duck. And it was a lot of fun. Absolutely, man. Yeah, no, I can't imagine anyone doing it all their own right like that's we're not gonna we're not gonna bob kane this scenario but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm, i started had a conversation a chat with greg weissman uh, a couple months ago and i guess i'll start this one the same way um in that i don't want to make you feel old but <laughs> it's okay <laughs> life has already done that <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said and my grandkids for that matter yeah <laughs> so uh, I talk a lot about like how I got into superheroes and comics and, and the like. And most of it revolves around the fact that when I was in daycare, we watched way too much TV. Uh, so a lot of my earliest memories are sitting in front of a TV set, watching Power Rangers, X-Men, Spider-Man, Batman, the animated series, but also the Disney afternoon, which included the show with my favorite theme song and character, Darkwing Duck. And so, so much of just early childhood for me included Darkwing. Uh, my mother bought the VHS from Target, if I remember correctly, because I, right. I begged for it. Uh, it was the two-part episode or TV movie or however they decided to designate it, mm -hmm. Just Us Justice Ducks. If, and, I, if I could reach it without killing myself, standing <laughs> on a revolving chair, I'd reach up and show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> so we lost the clamshell long ago, but she still has it in one of those like black VHS holders. Uh -huh. I played that tape out. Um, and what's funny is I, I didn't realize until just recently how much of Darkwing I never saw as a kid. Uh, because most of the time, I just popped in that VHS because I could watch it oh, whenever I sense. wanted. Yeah. And then, you know, when I'm at daycare, whatever episode is on TV at the time is what I saw. Uh, but there's like 90 episodes of Darkwing Duck. Like 91, like, yeah. 
there's a lot out there. And so I've been enjoying going through it with my three-year-old um, when she'll sit still. And <laughs> and I love that we can just kind of pick out any episode. Um, but yeah, I just had to tell you that you're part of my formative years. Just Darkwing Duck is such a thing for me. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Thanks. But I, I like to start these interviews out at the beginning, trying to get some some backstory. So obviously you don't just stumble into a career in animation. Um, what was it that kind of sparked you? Oh. <laughs> I actually, there was some stumbling going on. It was a oh. lot of luck is what it ended up being. I mean, oh. I loved, I love comics. I love cartoons. Uh, and what was nice, my dad had wanted to be a, uh, newspaper cartoonist like an editorial cartoonist mm. uh he graduated college having been a cartoonist on a humor uh paper at usc doing cartoons for the daily trojan although those he had to carve in a linoleum block so can't really work on your style much that way uh but when he graduated it was less about chasing your dreams and more about you know putting food on the table. Mm. So he ended up in advertising. But in the meantime, he had this collection of art books, not just classic art books, but cartooning books. Mm. I had the, the famous artist cartoonist course, which is, you know, by Milt Kniff, Al Cap, Harry Hagenson, Willard Mullen, all these fan, <clears throat> fantastic classic cartoonists. I grew up with that. That was like a storybook I read was going through these classes. Learning to draw was was included word balloons and how to draw a panel and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, he also had books on animation, like this one. <laughs> you can see what condition it's in, <laughs> held together wow. by clips. Uh, when I went to Disney, I think every young animator had this book, which mm. had not only the basics of animation, but the basics of character designs and, uh, you know, the goofy character, the cute character, but things like this, like line of action in animation and how to make a more powerful drawing. Um, we all had that book, but I had it at an early age. So I just loved all that stuff. Um, so I wanted to do it. <clears throat> and, and at the same time I was sucked into, you know, comics, uh, and then, in my high school years, I kind of thought the only place worth working at would be Disney because they were the only ones in town doing full animation. All mm. of television was done by, you know, limited animation that was, you know, done limited because of the commercial. I mean, you couldn't do full animation. It was too expensive. Mm. Uh, so I thought, you know, that's the only place worth working. They have their guys. But, and frankly, when I was in high school, that was close to the truth that mm. you're talking about many of the great animators were still there um and in fact for the long time roy disney senior wanted to shut down animation way mm. back when he mm. said look if we just do seven movies we can just keep re-releasing them um and walt had different ideas but then when walt got sidetracked into disneyland and that was a whole new world of creativity the animators kind of thought our, our time here is limited that Walt basically had the feeling of, so I've been told anyway, that, you know, these guys started the business with me, started the company with me, you know, let's continue it until, you know, they reach retirement age or whatever. Well, Walt died before that time mm -hmm. and they all braced themselves for kind of, here it goes. But uh, luckily one of the, you know, Walt died during jungle book, I guess um but they kept going they let them keep doing movies and then they did robin hood which actually made so much money that management took notice um and said because by this time roy disney senior again had died uh management said this is actually the core of our business and things sprout from it and it made a lot of money this robin mm -hmm. thing so what are you guys doing to train new people and it went like train. Okay. So they, I didn't know it, but basically in my later high school years and in my college years, they started a training program that was basically Eric Larson, um, one of the nine old men of Disney. Um, and he would just work with these trainees that would come in. 
So the review board, again, largely made up of these guys, of the classic animators that you can find in every book on animation, um, would look at portfolios and get them in. <clears throat> the only way I found out about that is the girl I was dating at the time uh, was sweet mates with a daughter of an old animator who is currently designing rides at, at, uh, at what is now Imagineering. Back then it was just WED. Uh, mm -hmm. And so she said, hey, there's this training program. You, you should try out for that. I went, what training program? So she got the contact for me. I made the call basically to find out information. And the call ended with, okay, so you can come in next Thursday or Thursday in two weeks. It was not a long period of time, especially since at the time I was not an art major. Mm. Uh, I hadn't been an art major since freshman year. And all my English teachers wanted me to go to English because of my writing. And I ended up in something called the humanities, which I thought was like a design your own major. So I could combine both. Mm. The end result is I never took a writing course <laughs> and uh, all my art courses kind of turned into 3D stuff like ceramics and all that, although mm. that paid off ultimately uh, because suddenly I had to put together a portfolio. I was a TA in ceramics. The, my ceramics teacher that I was assisting had just taken over the art department because the head was on sabbatical huge Disney fan. So he made sure I could sit in on all the uh, life drawing classes so I could quickly put together a portfolio. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so I took my stuff in, they gave notes. I came back a few days later with extra drawings. Uh, a lot of that, some of the action drawings, the sports drawings were basically exaggeration that I'd learned from that famous artist cartoonist course. Mm. Um, and I, I was accepted. So I started at Disney three days after graduation. And the manager of the department said, are you sure you want to start now? Because if you get accepted, it'll be a year before you get a vacation. And I said, I'm not going to enjoy any vacation until I know whether I'm in or not. Right. Uh, so you had four weeks to do an a animation test, basically because of that book I showed you and general knowledge and uh, the art of animation by bob thomas which was a disney book uh i knew the basics i could work with eric and actually get started on my thing my first test was just an alligator standing up on two legs in a pirate hat and kind of doing a little jig and then he threw up a sword and caught it with his tail and as rough as it was as basic as it was the uh review board felt like they'd gotten a feeling of personality from this gator and that's what they cared about mm -hmm. my Second one was way more ornate. Uh, parts of it were way stiffer, but I survived that. And then I went into production as an in-betweener. And I was so bad as an in-betweener, I almost got fired. So my career could have been very short. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's how I got into Disney animation. I started in features. And that girlfriend uh, is now my wife. So that worked out too. Nice. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I stayed at Disney until they showed me the door at uh 2003 i think and then i had another 10 years in animation doing a couple of hellboy animated movies and a uh, movie for netflix and uh, a new adventures of burr rabbit and universal pictures you know so i had the gamut in disney and outside of disney so so i mean you were a part of disney during you know what is now known as the sort of disney animation renaissance where i for me, that was just like, like for me growing up, there either had the Disney house or the not Disney house. So I grew up in the <laughs> Disney house. And like, if I wanted to watch like a Don Bluth feature, my cousins had those. But like uh -huh. my mom was going to the store, getting whatever the newest Disney movie was, whatever was coming out of the vault. We went to Disney World several times in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And it was just Disney ran the world as far as I was concerned. Yeah. Um, well, I was actually there. I came in just before the Renaissance because the guy who came who was in the training program like five months before me, the, pre mm -hmm. the previous trainee was Ron Clemens. And Ron and John Musker, of course, did Little Mermaid and mm -hmm. Aladdin and Princess and the Frog and Treasure Planet and Moana and, you know, 
they were a huge part of that Disney renaissance. So we came in, it was still these, I started working for Wooly Reitherman and because I got to move into story, uh, even though I was moved up to assistant animator. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, I had one scene in The Rescuers, but on Fox and Hound, I got to do story. I mean, it's uncredited, but um, that's right. Things changed. Wooly left. There was a new directing team. And that's about when I was moved over to Imagineering and worked on the Imagination Pavilion. And and before that, the Transportation Pavilion with Ward Kimball. And you talk about a great animator with a ton of stories. I mm. wish I had taken notes the, the entire time. So <clears throat> basically, I was in one of the founding fathers of TV animation that was started when Michael Eisner came in. And about that same time is when uh, Ron and John were working on Little Mermaid. And in mm. fact, they gave me an early script to read because I shared an office with Ron. And they say, well, here's somebody who knows animation, but totally disconnected from the department. Mm. Um and Ron lives not too far from me. Uh, oh, nice. So it was like, so I really feel, feel like uh, the, the blue picture, Feifel and the Spielberg picture uh, kind of kicked Disney in the pants, made them mm -hmm. say, hey, here's some, here's stuff that they made a lot of money on this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right when Disney management came uh, or changed. And they looked at animation as this is making movies this so animation had had these bizarre ways of being done and features like well we don't use scripts we kind of work out an outline we we explore it visually and it was like there are strengths to all of that mm -hmm. but when you're talking about story arcs character development all of that it's like you know cinema has been around for a hundred years we kind of have ways that actually work mm -hmm. and they brought they brought in the idea of and I mean, Ron and John did a script, not only a script, but they brought in the idea of let's bring an editor on at the beginning of the process so that an editor, editor using story reels can start building a movie and can say things like, I could make this cut better if I had this kind of scene. Well, go down the hall and some artists would draw up that kind of scene and they really could develop it. I think the movies became more cinematic, not just in composition. Mm -hmm. But just the actual process, they really became movie makers because, and Ron Clemens was the one who pointed it out when Don Bluth was still at Disney. He once gave a talk and he was saying like, you know, to the various trainees and the young people uh, about, you should go and see mimes. You should see uh, plays and watch how actors play to the back of the audience and all that. And Ron came out of one of those meetings and said to me, he never talks about movies. He talks about plays. He talks about this, but we're making movies. It's literally film you know, projected onto a screen for people to watch. Uh, and I think that changed in a major way. Again, when these movie makers came uh, to, to Disney and brought that sensibility to it. So anyway, that was what was going on at features. <clears throat> I had been around designing rides. I came back then I went to consult on TV there's about a year and a half that I wondered what I was doing and how I was getting a paycheck mm -hmm. and then ended up in this first meeting about TV animation and uh, didn't go right away, went back to features. And then I was actually thinking of leaving the company when I ran into one of the guys from uh, who was you know, starting a TV animation, one of the executives, he said, oh, you should come and visit. And I came and visited and he's kind of introducing me as, yeah, Ted's going to be coming over here. I didn't say anything, but I'm going, I, I never said that, but mm -hmm. uh, had a meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg and he said, Tad, it's not a one-way street if it doesn't work out, but right now they could really use you. Well, it's pretty much a one-way street, uh, but it didn't matter. I was actually better suited for television instead of doing one. I mean, my life had gone a different path, who knows, but um, instead of doing one story for four years, you know, I was doing many stories so about one character one group of characters but i enjoyed working with people on new stories and fresh ideas and all that it just suited me better so so there's a couple of stumbles in there if i had dated a different person i never would have found out about the training program 
if wow. I had been, I don't know, a better in-betweener, maybe I wouldn't have moved into story. <laughs> um, and it's because of these weird projects I did that I was invited to that first meeting about TV animation and then invited to join TV animation. Yeah. That's, that's wild. It's, it's crazy to think about just kind of the paths we take and where they lead, even when we don't yeah. know it. Um, but I guess something that's been central to this theme, right? You're talking about story and whether it's feature films, uh, stage productions, rides, you talked about rides, working on rides, mm -hmm. and then television, like it's all story, but then you've got to sort of change it to fit whatever the medium is. Yeah. How easy is that to do? Well, things are, each is, is a whole different type of storytelling. I mean, when rides, they'll often talk about, uh, the old guys would talk about rides as in like go through the Pirates of the Caribbean and they would describe, well, here's this scene and then here's the governor being dunked in a well while his wife is saying, doesn't want him to give up the treasure. And they, mm. they, they talk it through as a storyline, but the reality is you're sitting in a boat and most of the audience is doing this. Right. <laughs> so things have to read in a different way, but that mm. also means they can go through the ride a second time. And this time they're, they're looking at different angles and stuff mm. like that. So it's kind of a different type of, of storytelling. Um, the, I remember the Michael Webster who was, I think president or chairman of the division at the time, uh, whatever his, he was head of, of TV animation. He reported to Gary Chrysler who eventually took over that spot. Um, but Gary was in charge of all television at the time. Uh, he said, Tad, you're going to come over here. And, and all I can say is television animation is entirely different from features. And then you're going to be here about a year and you still won't realize how different it is. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent that was true. And part of it was, although it didn't take me a year, I think to catch on, but part of it is just the pace and, and terms of thinking, how fast you have to move. Now my advantage is because of my background in animation and storyboarding um, and not just storyboarding. In fact, we weren't back then storyboarding from a script. You were conceiving of gags and emotional moments that you then cobbled together into a scene and then mm. got input from directors and animators. And, you know, it grew organically that way. But when I went to start writing scripts, I was mentally storyboarding them. So I was very careful of not being too wordy, not trying to describe too much for each shot, you know, really protecting the eventual storyboard artist and the animator from putting too much in or, or making the script too long because mm -hmm. I pointed out to somebody uh, who one of my, actually it was on a Darkwing Duck project. And uh, one of the notes I gave was this script is way too long because they were going by page count. And I said, you have a whole a sequence here where they sneak into a building. Well, a director is going to want to play that out and have mm -hmm. them sneak into the building. The music's going to be tense. They're going to be peeking around corners. They're going to tiptoe through here. Um, that's all going to eat up time. And that's going to take up way more time than all these pages of words that you have here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, they, it does take a while to get used to that. And I was lucky it was kind of bred into me. Gotcha. Nice. Mm -hmm. And so... Um... I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, right, the 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 cause for this occasion, why we're here. Um, Dynamite Entertainment uh, currently holds the rights to uh, Darkwing Duck in comics. They've been publishing Darkwing comics for the last year and a half or so. Um, but right now they have a Kickstarter campaign going. Uh, if you're listening to this or watching this as it premieres, then you've got about five hours left to back this campaign. Um, and... What it's going to collect are several iterations of Darkwing Ducks in comics. So there is the sort of classic collection, which will include the four issue Disney Comics limited series from 1991, as well as a series I didn't know existed until this campaign, uh, which is the Marvel Disney Afternoon comic. Yeah. Um, so there yeah, were 
I didn't know it existed either. <laughs> I was I was in Agrabah at the time, dealing with genies and flying carpets. Uh, <laughs> and I've yet to see it, but people have mentioned that, oh, three of those issues, mm-hmm. they put Darkwing in a human world. Huh. You know, not even dog noses. And it's my feeling is always, you know, there was a cartoon show you could have watched. But <laughs> no, so I'm looking forward to that collection just out of curiosity and a little bit of dread. Right, because I own the the Disney comics, the the ninety one series, but I've never mm-hmm. seen that that Disney Afternoon comic, um, and apparently it was an anthology. So, kind of like the like I've got a Fantagraphics collection here of different Disney Afternoon adventures, and you would get like yeah. Chip and Dale and Tailspin and all the things in one book. And so this Darkwing collection, of course, is only going to collect the Darkwing stories from those ten issues, which is fine with me. Um, but, but so there's that's one collection. Another collection is going to uh, collect the 10 issue Amanda Dibert and Carlo Loro series uh, that Dynamite published last year. Um, and then the third collection, I believe it's called Heroes and Villains, but that's going to collect the Justice Ducks series, which is uh, still ongoing. It might just be wrapping yeah. up this week. I think um, it's still got a few issues to go because I know I haven't read them yet. Got you. So, yeah, it's, it's a Justice Duck series by Roger Langridge, uh, also by, with Carlo Loro on art. So same as the uh, previous Darkwing series. And then the Nega Duck series by Jeff Parker. I believe that's going to run eight issues, which are still ongoing as we speak. Yeah. Um, and those, by the way, have been outstanding comics. Of course, I've been collecting them all in single issues and I'm still having a hard time. Like, okay, am I going to just back for all three hardcovers? Because when am I going to see these again? Uh, yeah. You, right, you got to go hardcover. Come on. <laughs> right. You, I, I mean, what, I, what I loved it really surprised me. I, I mean, I had nothing to do with any of this mm-hmm. licensees coming and go. But um, I just assumed they were putting out a Darkwing Duck comic. And then suddenly they announced, you know, Nega Duck and then mm-hmm. Justice Ducks. And, uh, so that just showed a commitment on dynamite's part to say no we're we're hitting this in a big way this is not just one thing we'll see how it does i mean you're still going to have to see how it does but right. you know the kickstarter helps the what i like is uh on the heroes and villains book mm-hmm. uh jeff parker did negaduck and he tweaked them a little from what we did negaduck mm-hmm. was pretty one note for us and that was the fun of him but Jeff said, wait, this guy is an evil reflection of Darkwing. So there should be more Darkwing in it. Mm-hmm. And that's what he did. I can You can see this is an amoral Darkwing or right. an immoral Darkwing, I suppose, that he still has Darkwing's huge ego. And it just mm-hmm. flushes him out more. And uh, he did. He created a bunch of new villains to play Negaduck off of because that's how you show what a villain's like is to give him more villainous adversaries. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that little tweak to his personality was great. Uh, But the big surprise for me actually was Roger Langridge's um, Justice Ducks Mm -hmm. because Carlo did the artwork, but he changed his art style for that one, which Mm -hmm. I think actually is to me much stronger and certainly fits what Roger is doing because Roger's one of the funniest, you know, he does art, he writes, uh, one of the funniest guys in comics and comedy in comics is harder than people think. I mean, mm-hmm. just you, you, there's no put a line out and wait for applause. There's you, know, you don't have the same kind of timing. Right. And he, uh, in my opinion, um, has done the closest to a classic Donald Duck or Uncle Scrooge comic, you know, back in the Carl Barks era mm-hmm. in that he gets into these stories in like a page and a half or less. It just, Boom, he gets he sets it up, you're in it. And uh most of them, at least the first half that I've read, mm-hmm. are standalone comics. You yeah. know, there's not even continuity in the Darkwing series that Amanda did. There's an ongoing story. Um, but in this, a lot of standalones, you just pick one up and enjoy it. And they are every page is chock full of humor and gags, both mm-hmm. dialogue, visually. Uh I'm it's probably my favorite of the three series, you know. Yeah, and and Carlo loves throwing in Easter eggs for people who watch the mm-hmm. shows. Um, it's it's been awesome. I really do like the way 
that Nega Duck and Justice Ducks kind of play off each other. Um, Cause like you said, uh, it's, it's really like that sort of dark opposite. So where Darkwing has the outsized ego and is like, I don't need a team. Like I got this, keep the camera on me. Nega Duck yeah. is very much the same way. So through this series, he is out to prove like why he's the, the greatest villain as Darkwing mm -hmm. is also trying to prove that he's the greatest hero while having to concede that, you know, he works better with the team. And so what's, just, what's fun is Jeff created all these other villains who are like hanging out. In, they're like interdimensional guys who are basically mm -hmm. hanging out in this universe because it's relatively safer. And mm -hmm. so they're basically showing around this cool hideout that they have and they're playing cards and whatever. And Darkwing has a fit and he says something like, evil isn't a hobby. <laughs> you know, it's a life. It's a commitment. It was just, it's, it's so funny to have that spirited speech right. about evil. You know, right. um, it's just, they're all fun comics. They've all done some, what I'm, I keep pointing out about Amanda's run on Darkwing is that she really gets, you know, she gets to go through because she has more issues. A mm. lot of the Darkwing villains, but she really nailed Morgana Macabre, mm. you know, really made her stronger than she was in a lot of the series. Um, I just, I keep pushing for, you know, uh, a six issue limited series of each of the Justice Ducks, you know, mm -hmm. except for Darkwing. Let them shine because each one could be a totally different feeling in comic, you know, go from supernatural stories. I mean, in the series, we played around with Universal Monsters and mm -hmm. a little bit of Lovecraft, uh, you know, classic stuff. Whereas, my feeling is no let let morgana get into like steve ditko uh dr strange mm -hmm. and um you know go through neil gaiman's sandman and see is there anything about the endless i can do a duck version of and mm -hmm. just do more of a i mean it has to be okay for kids but more of a little horror tinge that you know you put it's you know what it could be like although not with the universal side, but Abbott and Costello meeting Frankenstein. You have mm. these comedic characters at the right. center with monsters chasing them. But here's a chance to really get creepy or Twilight Zone-ish, you know. This is, I mean, this is what people say, hey, Tad, would you like to do some comics? And, and I've done some covers for them. But mm. it's like, no, this is what I like doing. I like coming up with stories. I want to bounce off of a writer and then let them do all the work. <laughs> you know, it's just like I just want to spit out a bunch of ideas. You don't have to take them, but mm. uh, just let me have that fun and hear what you have to say, and let me see if I can plus that. And that's frankly what I miss most about my career in animation is mm. the people I got to work with. You know, the talented crews, artists, and writers. And you shouted out the crews um, behind Darkwing Duck at the top of the. Uh, conversation. Uh, but I did want to ask just sort of how the things came about. You kind of got dragged into animation um, and that, then you end up, you know, as a creator on this show. Um, but maybe what happens in between? The, uh, when I moved to, I mean, I had that meeting on, on uh, a TV animation, the first one, it was actually at Michael Eisner's house on a mm -hmm. Sunday, but it was the end of his first week he was there. So it really showed how he thought television animation was important because he felt look animation is the heart of disney it should everywhere there is animation disney should be there mm -hmm. it's not all going to be equal but wherever you are they should be top of the line mm -hmm. um so i was at that meeting and i had pitched things and the reason i was at the meeting is that a lot of those people came from the licensing side or the um because they had pitched television projects before with the previous management so i had done some work for them and had stuff to show actually from those meetings that i could then pitch but then i went back to whatever i was doing uh and when i thought i was when i was considering leaving the company and just freelancing storyboarding and then my idea was well then i can that'll pay the bills and then i can write science fiction short stories or whatever to mm -hmm. feed my soul. Um, I talked to, you know, the executive who was at that meeting and he invited me over and suddenly I'm sucked in on that side. Um, I was technically management when I first went there, a uh, creative manager. So really my job should have been 
calling up agents, bringing in writers from the outside, um, taking their pitches, um, and then presenting them. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I was too dumb. So all I knew, <laughs> I was saying like, oh, it's up to me to come up with some ideas. And I felt, even though that's the way Hollywood worked, because I had just worked within Disney, mm-hmm. the idea that somebody would write up something and all this detail without being paid just struck me as wrong. That can't be the way it works. So mm-hmm. we had these gong shows where a lot of things are pitched to management with just two or three lines. And I remember one that came up and we pitched 23 items and I think 18 were mine. Uh, but they were just one liners. Like the one I remember is um, Trojan birds and legionnaire cats. And it was just kind of a road. And thank God they didn't take that idea because trying to come up with a full season, who knows, but it was like road and coyote, except my idea is that, The birds were up in these giant trees. That's where the city of Troy was. And then the cats were legionnaires. And it was just that kind of broad action gags. But that's Mm. as simple as you would pitch. And they would just go gong or ask a few questions about it or whatever. Mm. So anyway, that got things I pitched, you know. So I didn't know anybody on the outside to to bring in. Uh, but that put me there. I was working with the crews that Gummy Bears had been created by Jim Magon and Art Patello. Art Patello is the director and really, I think, worked closely with Jim. And Jim got a lot of his animation knowledge from Art. Uh, they did two, two seasons with NBC. NBC wanted to change. And suddenly, I was christened as, who do we got in the room? Dad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm literally the only one in the room. Uh, so suddenly I was, I thought just the story editor on Gummies, but uh, I was partnered up with Alan Zaslov, who had come from UPA and Warner Brothers and, you know, throughout the industry, had all sorts of credits. Um, and <clears throat> we jumped into the third season of Gummies and still storyboards came through me so I could check the story. And I would always add in gags or, you know, suggest drawings. And then I got to the end, they say, we're going to make you co-producer. And my response was, I would have given different notes. <laughs> if I was a producer, I tried to keep it down here. Uh, so we did one season of that and then, you know, developed Rescue Rangers. And uh, that was my first full-on show that I was in charge of. Uh, and then after that, Darkwing. And then after that, because of my feature background, I went through all the or many of the uh, spinoff shows like Aladdin, Hercules, Buzz Lightyear, Star Command, a little bit of Atlantis, you know, Mm. so all that. Nice. No, I remember all of those vividly. Buzz Lightyear of Star Command used to come on in the mornings, or at least I guess reruns, I don't know, but it came on weekday mornings. And if Buzz Lightyear of Star Command was on, that means we were late for school. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. So I was told once by Lynn Manuel Miranda, you know, I was at San Diego Comic Con behind the scenes with the guys from DuckTales, and mm-hmm. Lynn was, you know, the voice of Gizmo Duck. And they introduced Lynn to me as if I was the star. Mm-hmm. And Lynn said, I used to run, he didn't run home. He'd leave school and he would run top speed to his friend's house because he couldn't make it to his home in time to catch DuckTales and Darkwing in the Disney afternoon. Mm. And he actually said that the line in Darkwing, he called it a triple rhyme, uh, but it was when you're in trouble, you call DW. Right. Uh, He says that's a direct line from that to some of the lyrics he did in in The Heights, his first musical on Broadway. So that was pretty awesome. But he loved that show, you know, and, you know, he was one of those guys who said, you made my childhood. So I felt damn good after that. <laughs> yeah, as you should. Yeah, yeah. Listen, you made my childhood too. I mean, I don't have all the accolades of a Lynn Manuel Miranda, but the it's just funny. Like, I don't know, talking to all sorts of different people, you don't realize kind of how small the world around some of your favorite things could be. Um, Cause I was talking to Greg, he was talking about uh, gummy bears and, um, the brand confusion between gummy bears and care bears and 
it's funny because I'm like, I remember being a kid and seeing bears on TV and being like, oh, never mind. <laughs> and like, he's like, yeah, people didn't give the show a chance. And I'm like, dang, that's me. I'm people. <laughs> and then, um, but, but yeah, like you just, you know, realize like just how small that world is. And, and I don't know, it, it makes you grateful, I guess, as a fan, as a viewer that, you know, creative people are in these positions and persist and keep working, you know? Um, but yeah, I remember Buzz Lightyear, Star Command. I remember the Aladdin animated series because, again, I don't know why I remember everything by like the time it would come on, but Aladdin would be on like early mornings. Uh, Little Mermaid would come on and then Aladdin, if I'm remembering correctly. But it was like, if we got to daycare early enough, we would get like two breakfasts <laughs> and <laughs> we could watch Aladdin. Um while eating the first breakfast. Then when the kids came in, you know, at the regular time, I guess they had parents that worked normal hours. <laughs> and so uh, you were like, so what you were like hobbits, you had like second breakfasts and <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. listen, man, we, uh, my mom worked like across town. So it was like everywhere mm -hmm. we went, we were there early and picked up late. So, oh yeah. Uh, but yeah. So I remember the Aladdin animated series. I remember the return of Jafar. Uh, cause I feel like I saw that before I saw Aladdin. Um, but we had, the well, that would make sense because it was, it was released on tape before the Aladdin series came out. It was made to introduce the Aladdin series, mm. but when Jeffrey saw the original animation, because the first half was done by Australian studios who were great. Mm. And it started with a Howard Ashman song, Arabian nights. Mm. Uh, and it, this great horse animation going across the deserts with the music swelling. Jeffrey turned around and he said, guys, this is looking pretty good. And he got into its head. He was very, he says, look, this has to be different features. We can't charge the same amount. But he said, this has to be finished as an A movie. Meaning I got to work with guys who had literally won the Academy Award for sound design on Twister. Wow. Uh, and it was, I learned all sorts of, you know, music editing and sound effects editing ideas mm -hmm. from them. I having already done it on my previous shows, but it was like a whole different level. Mm -hmm. um, so that was anyway, that, so Return of Jafar was released early. So that actually would be true. You probably did see it before Aladdin, the series. Got you. But yeah, no, I love the series. Um, not to go too far on a detour, but I feel like, I don't know, a lot of like the sort of sequels or like made for TV movies that come from, you know, these big features, they're hit and miss. It's like, you know, sometimes you feel like there's more story to be told. Other times it just feels like they just wanted to tell another story. So people would buy it. Um, the Aladdin animated series though, I felt like does a great job. Cause it's like, you don't see Aladdin like as Sultan or you don't really see him with jasmine after they're married like you don't really see a lot of adventures so the well, that was series... the re that was actually the the reason for return of jafar mm. which which frankly i have problems with i haven't watched it in a long time and i actually don't own it on any media i'd have to watch on disney plus mm. uh and i don't downplay it anymore because i've had too many people saying oh i love that movie i watched it over and over again uh -huh. okay. but i mean it was supposed to be four parts of, you know, of a story, but the, my feeling was, I don't think kids are going to want to watch a show about a rich married couple. Right. I mean, yeah, they could still have, and, and you could do it. It's all a matter of design and you, you still have to have great adventures, but, but, uh, there's two things I want to do. I wanted them not to get married and I wanted Iago as part of the team. Because if you look at the original movie, if you take away the genie, because obviously everybody remembers Robin Williams, Iago is hilarious. He's yes. also the smartest one. All the good ideas come from the bird. And he was just so conniving and all that. He was, you know, I said, I won him because I was thinking in terms of a team that we were mm -hmm. going to have Abu and Aladdin and Carpet and Genie and and, and Jasmine often. Uh, I need the bird in there to be like the sand, the grit there that 
you know, and the guy you can't trust, right? The Dr. Smith of uh, Lost in Space. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, anyway, those are the things I wanted to set up, and that was the excuse to tell this rambling story. After, you know, out of that, our mm-hmm. second movie, uh, Aladdin the King of Thieves, yes. was more okay. We want to up our game and let's do a story for for this, and that one finally getting married more heart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Then we could marry him off. Yeah. Right. No, I had that one on VHS as well. Um, the things that stick in your head, like follow the trail of the 40 thieves, your father's trap beyond the world. I don't know why that is still just huh. stands out. Just, yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, no. So yeah, I love the Aladdin animated series, even like what I've seen of the little mermaid animated series. I'm like, this works like just keep telling adventures um and maybe it's just speaks to just kind of the greatness of the characters that disney creates um yeah you just, you i just mean i was very world. self-conscious about and i suppose we can get back to dark one soon but <laughs> i was very self-conscious of aladdin because again i shared an office with ron clemens mm-hmm. and i thought aladdin is a fantastic movie it's full animation mm-hmm. and here i'm going into it and with you know not even a tenth of the budget you know this minuscule budget i'm going to have to tell stories at a blinding rate as far as turning out scripts and all that and you know i kind of ran up i had to i need the blessing of ron and john who are friends Mm -hmm. of mine but but just and they had no problem with it and in fact when return just return to jafar made a ton of movie a ton of money Mm -hmm. uh like movie scale money uh I, you know, we got a bonus over at TV animation and they divided it up smartly or not. They divided it up. So everybody got something. And, you mm-hmm. know, those of us who were at the core of it got more, but mm-hmm. some people got, I think like $50, which as instead of being a reward, they looked at the box office of the tape and right. basically it would just piss them off. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I told them how much I got little self-conscious of it and their reaction was you got ripped off (laughs) because and that kind of made me stand back because it's like if i had been a live action director and i did a sequel even a crummy sequel to a successful movie Mm. that made as much money as return of jafar did and only cost as much return of jafar i would have a seven picture deal and probably a ferrari given to me as a gift sitting in my driveway Wow. So when, when you put it in that perspective, you go, yeah, maybe, maybe I did get ripped off. Not that I went and asked for more money. Mm-hmm. I just remember uh, talking to the head, the head of animation was Gary Kreisel. And he's really the reason why uh, TV animation on the business side existed and became stronger. It was Gary being there and being, frankly, being cheap. He treated Disney money like it was his money. Mm. Um, And I kind of paraphrased, you know, a line out of Ghostbusters because when he told us, oh, we're getting these bonuses, we have this much to spread. And he said, they asked me, you know, is this enough money? And he said it was. And I just looked at him and I said, Gary, when they ask you if it's enough money, you say, no. <laughs> no, but it was like, and he and it looked at me, it was so foreign to him to act that way, but it was like, <laughs> they wanted to give you more money. They wanted to give us more money. Right. Uh, and that's why they loved him. You know, he kept, ran a very tight ship. Mm. And uh, on the other hand, when it came to renaming Darkwing, I was shocked that Gary put up $500 in 1990 money. Um which is probably close to 900 in our money as a contest, whoever named the duck would, you know, get that prize. And I was like, we got a name out of it from Alan Burnett, who of course did the animated Batman. Um, and it wasn't even close. It was like dark wing and a bunch of trash. It was wow. like nothing even close. It wasn't even like, well, give me the top five names. It was like, no, I pointed to it and I said, that's it. Darkwing is the character he thinks he is, mm. but I'm putting duck with it because it makes it sound silly, which is closer to who he really is. Um, and it wasn't even, there was nothing that even 
anyone would dare bring up as an alternate, you know, right. not that everybody had fun, but it was just like, you look back at it and you go, Oh yeah. Not Nightwing. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't think of that? So, right. No, that's, that's awesome. So uh dark wing starts out as a pitch and you're developing it as, as double O duck. Um, yeah. And you know, it does have to get renamed because uh, Ian Fleming's estates like now we've got double O. Yeah, specifically, yeah, specifically, it was the guys who owned the rights. It was the movie people. Cubby Broccoli was the name of the producer, did tons of those Bond pictures. Mm. Uh, So it was the movie guys who opened up Variety, and here was a double page spread announcing Double O Duck. Mm. And they let like little things slide, like an episode of DuckTales called Mm. Double O Ducks. But they were trying to reinvigorate the Bond series and to see they're saying no one's going to take it seriously. Or yeah. at least there's a danger of that. We don't want somebody goofing on it while we're trying to make it grittier than it used to be or whatever. Um, so, yeah, we lost the name. And then mentally that helped me because it really got me away from the spy stuff, even though we had already drifted from spies into pulp heroes. Mm. But uh, And I ended smack dab in the comics of my youth, even before Marvel Comics, the Silver Age of Comics mm. and early Marvel comics were one and done's even yeah. early marvel they were just one story per issue mm-hmm. um and you know you knew the basic continuity but it didn't really matter you knew that yeah lois lane clark can't perry white i know those guys i know the relationships uh but every story any story you could pick up and uh they never explained hard things like how did the joker get out of prison they didn't matter. You know, right. all it knows is no matter how many of these crazy criminals dark or excuse me, Batman defeats and locks up, they're going to be free. You know, anytime the writers want to bring them back, you know, that they're not going to explain it. That, well, you had a really good lawyer. Um, no, they're just going to be there robbing a bank on a giant typewriter or something. Right. And so, um, well, with that, I guess walk us through like the idea of Darkwing Duck and and how we land on, you know, what we all know now. Well, he started out as Double O Duck, straight James Bond parody. Mm -hmm. That did not fly with Jeffrey. Jeffrey wanted, first of all, the biggest thing it missed was Disney Heart. Uh, And we came up with the idea of what if he had a little girl they had to raise? It's going to be an obstacle. And what if that little girl refused to stay at home because the personality I wanted was Calvin out of Calvin and Hobbes Mm -hmm. uh, in a little girl form. Uh, which solved the question of why did Batman think he needed a nine-year-old kid in bright clothes to help him fight crime? Right. Didn't make a lot of sense, but you know, I picked up comics. I just accepted it was Batman and Robin. Uh, But this way it's like, no, she was not supposed to come along. You know, you know, sometimes Darkwing obviously off screen had already given up and she was just there. Other times it was like, Oh no, he's tried to leave her back. Um, Anyway, so that gave us the heart. We knew that, no, he has to raise this little girl. He can kind of move to suburbia to help because the little girl has to go to school and all that. That complicates all the stuff. You know, he needs to do more in a more flamboyant way. Um, It was the early visual of him was just, and you've probably seen it online. It just looks like Donald Duck in a white tuxedo, except Mm -hmm. it's bandana mask, a cape and a hat. And, uh, we were brainstorming one day. Uh, I just called in a lot of the guys who would eventually be my story editors on the project. And the nice thing is they were already either staff story editors or staff writers, meaning they weren't assigned to any one show. So you can make use of that. I mean, Greg called me in to t- talk about Gargoyles once, you know, in this case, I called in a bunch of the guys who I wanted to eventually work on the show. It was Dwayne Capizzi who did, um, he had done ALF, uh, then did Jackie Chan Adventures, uh, Men in Black, uh, Rusty and Big Guy, uh, and I think currently is doing Transformers series. Mm. Uh, anyway, Dwayne looked at this guy in a tuxedo and mask, and he said, this looks more like, doesn't look like a spy. It looks like the old pulp heroes, like the Shadow and Green Hornet. And that was like, yeah, it does. That was amazing, and it, mm. it gave us a different template. Uh, notably Doc Savage, and, and I knew this stuff from being a comics fan, 
kind of crossed with science fiction fandom and old pulp fandom. So I had heard, you know, shadow radio shows or Green Hornet radio shows on tape mm. uh, or read like a Doc Savage story in paperback form. Uh, Doc Savage had a, had a group of experts that he worked with, uh, and they were all super eccentric characters. I mean, one guy, one of the scientists literally looked like a Neanderthal man, and he was constantly with this uptight Englishman uh, that they constantly squabble with each other. But that was, you know, you could tell they would die for each other at the same time. Mm. Uh, and I said, that gives us a different template to use instead of Q and money penny and the double O stuff. Um, ultimately, and Launchpad was always in the background. It was kind of like having Fonzie as a guest star or something like uh. that. Big, but he could be, you know, the transportation guy. Mm. Uh, Anyway, it the problem was we had too many characters. They were great for a long time. Dark Green was well, Double O was teamed with a short guy in a bowler hat. I remember. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but that's who we picked out of this group. Uh, it was just too many people in a twenty-minute episode. The more people you have, the harder it is to service each of them and still move the story along. So we trimmed and trimmed and trimmed. We knew we were always going to have you know Drake and Goslin. Uh, but then it was like it came down to Launchpad. We need somebody to, I want him to have a plane and all of that. It's like he serves multiple purposes. And really the idea of that many experts mm -hmm. back at headquarters, really that would just keep the story from going forward. Because you to give them any comedy or any setup, you would take all of Act 1 or something. Right. Um, so we pared it down that way. Then, like I say, when we lost the name, it had already started shifting toward comics. Mm. And with the idea of Batman and The Flash both having fantastic rogues galleries and Spider-Man 2, for that matter, um, that started me down that road and uh, embracing that in a, in a big way. Um, and specifically, Silver Age, Golden Age to a certain extent, extent, but Silver Age Batman is when he had bat everything not just yeah. the batarangs he had and bat hound he had a bat mobile obviously mm -hmm. bat copters you know bat plane bat boat and all that mm -hmm. so darkwing was supposed to have he had the rat catcher which was a judge dread motorcycle uh which ended up less like Dr 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 judge dread once we put a duck bill on it mm -hmm. the thunder quack of course is plane and he actually was going to have a boat called the wave shredder and that's why saint canard has a river going around it so mm -hmm. he could use this boat which we never did um but you know those other things you know were fine enough um and it, so that was directly out of the whole idea that batman had his face on everything because these those silver age and even yeah. the end of the golden age that's when he had a big bat face on the head of the car it was right. this big sleek car mm -hmm. the closest thing is i think bruce tim's in uh in the animated series mm. uh with a big single fin on the back hood and yeah you know, this big bat face in the front um uh, so it's just he was he had a lot of trademark you know right. lawsuits going on to keep his his uh, trademark there uh so darkwing was the same way i wanted to keep that the other thing i wanted from the shadow was i love the weed of crime there's bitter fruit who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, the shadow does. And then he would laugh, echoing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's what I want from Darkwing. I want him to have this, he'll come out of smoke, you know, have this echoing laugh. Mm -hmm. um, so it used to be Darkwing would only say one thing. He'd say, I'm the terror that flaps in the night. I'm the wing scourge that pecks at your nightmares. I am Darkwing Duck. Mm -hmm. um, and then I told the story a lot recently. Uh, just a few scripts later, we had a script called Double Dark Wings and Launchpad had to masquerade as Darkwing. Yeah. And the gag was he always got the line wrong. <laughs> and it was so hilarious. Again, the way I viewed the show is I'm not going to, you know, a, a foolish consistency is a hobgoblin of little minds, they say. Mm. Uh, anyway, it's like, yeah, I'm this is too good to remain just a gag in this episode let's yeah. give it to Darkwing. we rewrote the early scripts we re-recorded the lines uh to give that 
to Darkwing, which is what everybody loves about that whole thing. Uh, and the fact that Launchpad was actually getting the lines right then in that show, it's like, uh-huh. yes, it wasn't as funny, but doesn't matter. Look what we got out of it. You know, right. same with Negaduck. Negaduck was created. I love Negaduck. And I said, bring him back. And I don't care how, what his origin is. Mm. We won't say anything about it. Let's just bring the character back. And, you know, again, the Silver Age of comics is very strong because the reason why Negaduck is yellow, black, and red is because the reverse Flash was yellow, black, and red. I grew up with him. That's the mm. epitome of a, an evil version of a hero. Um, and that's, there was no other explanation of that. It was just like, those are evil colors. Come on. Right. Um, nice. so anyway and by that time we're up and going and and we're just doing all sorts of things my favorite stuff was always you know i wrote an initial script that showed how wild we could go and that was that sinking feeling with the uh, uh moliarty and you know in the third ep- in the third act in the climax they're in a baseball park suddenly they're all wearing baseball uniforms and we mm. didn't explain where they came from and that was you know, I regret not when that episode came back, I should have every once in a while showed it to the team again to yeah. just make them realize, no, we can go farther. You can really break rules on this for the sake of the gag and contain it. And who knows what the rules are? Well, you'll know it when you see it. Right. Um, but that, the you know, to me, the crazier episodes are the, the ones I like the most that uh, one where, you know, you have, um, you know, lost in a world of modern art paintings and, you know, they're running from painting to paint painting, you know, mm-hmm. ones where people are typing up a comic book story and we're seeing the adventure that changes depending mm-hmm. on who's at the typewriter writing the script. Um, Twin Beaks, which was our parody of Twin Peaks. Those are all the crazy episodes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's what I loved about Darkwing as a kid was it felt like, I don't know. There was like classic Disney because you would see that like in reruns or you, that'd be what you watched at school. Like when the, the teachers wanted to play a movie that was safe. So we watched yeah. like old Mickey or Donald and Goofy and stuff like that. And it was like that was very clearly different than like the Looney Tunes and stuff that was uh, playing on Cartoon Network and stuff around the same time. But Darkwing feels like it's got classic Disney and some Looney Tunes and it, like the gags, the the timing, the quick humor, like it just worked for me. Well, again, when I was growing up, Disney held on to their short subjects. They did not release them to television except on the Mickey Mouse Club. You'd mm-hmm. have, and you're way too young to remember, but they'd do this Miska Muska Mouseketeer time for mm-hmm. this one, whatever how it was, but they would show one cartoon per show. And I guess it was a Monday through Friday show. Um, and that was it meanwhile Warner Brothers said we have all these cartoons give us money and we'll let you show them so I grew up on classic Warner Brothers cartoons you know Daffy Duck Bugs Bunny you know the earliest Bugs Bunnies and even because different packages went to different you know studios or networks um, the lunchtime show in LA um, Sheriff John would show cartoons that even were silent cartoons. I didn't realize till later that, no, that was a silent cartoon that had someone put a soundtrack to so they could sell it to television. So I saw um, Coco the Clown out of the inkwell was one of the earliest, you know, cartoons Um, and precursors to all the Warner Brothers stuff. There was Bosco. There was, uh, what did he become? He became Billy or whatever they changed him. Mm. Um, but all the, just the stuff, all the, you know, Porky pig when he was still huge and, and fat yeah. <laughs> before he became shorter and cuter. Mm. Uh, so I had all that background, all the Fleischer weird stuff. I still have visual memories of, of this one where they're, these guys are running away from the Sphinx in Egypt. And mm. it's just this putting two claws out and running with a, you know, an animated background going back while its eyes were swirling around just nightmarish stuff. Uh, but definitely my hu- cartoon humor came out of those years. Cause that's what was on TV. That's what, I mean, I didn't get to see a bunch of Disney shorts really until I started work at Disney and they would mm-hmm. show us a half hour's worth there, you know, once a month or, you know, whatever. 
uh, and we could check things out and put them on our own moviola to examine stuff. Um, so yeah, a lot of that is in, in Darkwing. Uh, you know, it's basically short sensibilities. Certainly there was Disney stuff that was fanciful too. Mm -hmm. Um, and plenty of, especially Ward Kimball pulling off certain gags. Um, but you know, all that was what I wanted dark room, dark wing, that kind of craziness. And now you definitely achieved that. Um, so I have to ask this. Uh, because I, I have to imagine that much like the name Darkwing, there couldn't have even been a follow up pitch. Right. The theme song. I don't know who decides that, but I just can't imagine a world where there's like seven drafts of that theme song that were even in contention. There was the way they did those things. Uh, Rescue Rangers, even more than Darkwing, is the potential payoff for a composer, a lyricist selling a theme song that was going to play every day is huge. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they would get submissions just for free. And these things would be not just because of synthesizers, but, you know, guys are going to put more into their demos to really make them sound finished. So actually with rescue Rangers, there were a handful that, Oh, I could see going that way. In mm -hmm. fact, the one that, I liked the most was we ended up buying them the music rights to because when the rescue rangers go into action, like in the ranger plane or something, you'll hear dun 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 dun. Mm -hmm. That's actually from a theme song that we didn't pick. I liked it at the time because it was the straightest. It sounded like something you would march to. And I thought that was just funny when you're talking about two inch high characters and all mm -hmm. that. But uh, again, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Gary Kreisel had started in the music company at Disney. Um, they had their beaks wet by that DuckTales, you know, callback. Yeah. The woohoo was the <laughs> phantom that walked the halls. Uh, <laughs> and that ended up being the ch 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 Chippendale yeah. uh, to get that kind of hiccup. And what I liked about Darkwing is Darkwing didn't have that. It was yeah. just, it was an awesome song. I loved the sax, um, but it didn't have that same kind of gimmick. It was just really good. I mean, in mm -hmm. some ways, Let's Get Dangerous in the center of it yeah. was that gimmick. But no, I just, I just thought it was great. So at the same time, there were other things that were pitched, but I don't remember. And so I had not as many were submitted as Rescue Rangers. Um, but I did have a, a cassette tape of, all these different ones so you could be constantly listening to them and i don't remember having a second follow-up i just mm. thought well that was really good now again i was not to me it's like and probably foolishly so i wasn't worried about getting the perfect theme song because the right one really does have an effect on your show it was yeah. like i have all this to worry about and these people, the head of the music department and my boss and all these people are going to have, and ultimately Jeffrey and Michael are going to pick the final one. I'm mm -hmm. just going to stay out of the way. But hearing that one, it's like, yeah, I really like that. You know, I wasn't going to give detailed notes or anything. Um, I just thought it was a, a great pick. It had been, if it had been something that for some reason I thought was truly awful. Yes. I would say something and fight for anything, but um but you know we had talented people in the music department talented my boss was a talented person as far as recognizing music and seeing things so uh i was real happy with it i just think it was awesome yeah no it, it's great uh the ducktales theme song is great chippendale is great yeah, it's had a great run of theme songs yeah, yeah. um man but anyway yeah, I couldn't couldn't let this interview pass without asking about the theme song because it's just so iconic to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, I do want to remind people because, well, now you've probably got four hours left <laughs> to back this campaign. <laughs> uh, but if you go to comicsordope.com slash Darkwing, you will find uh, Dynamite's Kickstarter for these three collections. You can get them in trade paperbacks. You can get them in hardcovers, which are oversized or like omnibus sized hardcovers um and you can even get like more limited with metal effects and all sorts of stuff going on uh there's art prints there's all sorts of things that you can get 
for backing this campaign. Uh, you can give it a even get like a really cool box set. Like there's a lot, a lot there. Uh, there's original. If you if you really got money to burn, there's original art where you can get four sketch covers that go together to do one image. Uh, that's like some awesome stuff. You see, I don't go to the comic store each week anymore. Mm -hmm. I every once in a while I'll go and buy something, but pretty regularly I will find something on Kickstarter that I want to support the artist, uh, whether they need it or not. You know, I got the Arthur Adams collection recently. Mm -hmm. I got, you know, uh, and to me, what I always do is you jump on a Kickstarter and you can get these things. And usually they're going to be more expensive once they're out in the real world, yes. you know, that this is the price you want to get it at. And, you know, at the very least, I would say, you know, get the, the dark wing soft cover collections. Yeah. You know, because then you've got them there, you know, you're not chasing separate issues all around. You've got the stories collected and, uh, I, they put together a beautiful package, I think. Absolutely. So you got time, a little bit of time. So just hurry over, right? Maybe open it in a new tab while you're listening to this. Um, but yeah, those the Kickstarter is really awesome. When Dynamite announced it, they gave me the pleasure of announcing the Kickstarter on the channel. And um, I was very excited because I don't know how it came up, but we'd been talking about Darkwing for a while. Um but anyway, I'm just so excited to see Darkwing in these new iterations. Uh, the Justice Duck series is great. The Darkwing series is great. Negaduck is great. Um, and I'm glad they're even reaching back and going in the archives and grabbing some classic stuff that I hadn't ever seen. Um, what's it been like for you, right, to be in the sort of the, the writer's room, uh, create this thing with, you know, your team and see it live on for as long as it has. Um, well, here's the thing I have to correct. It's a minor thing, but uh, we didn't have a writer's room. In fact, when I went and visited the guys on DuckTales 2017, one of the first things the writer, uh, one of the writers asked me is, how big was your writer's room? And I, went, I practically did a spit take. I said, we didn't have a writer's room. People ran into my office. They'd pitch me a story. We'd go back and forth and argue and then come up with something. They'd go back and write it up and boom. <laughs> we wow. then did that. There was no, the idea that we're going to get together a few months early and we're going to map out this arc and weave the secondary character. And then that arc will come to the top. And then th it's like, no, it was more like, ah, we got to get something out. Okay. So uh, that was that was our feeling. But having said all that, obviously, in my talk here, you you see how my love of those early comic books when comics were simpler, you know, mm -hmm. and hey, I bought in big to, to Marvel Comics and, you know, had complete sets of Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and Iron Man and Avengers. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so I appreciated all the soap opera and continuity that came along. But those early, that early crazy time of the early Marvels and all the DC stuff, you can see that Darkwing taps in on that. So the fact that it came back, you know, and this is like, well, aside from the early stuff, Boom Studios took a shot at it and Joe Books kind of continued that on. And then what Dynamite has done is really committed to it not just with one book with three books mm -hmm. and the the comic knowledgeable comic writers that they brought on to it uh jeff parker who does negaduck actually um worked on rusty and big guy the animated series so he started in storyboard storyboard cleanup mm -hmm. and Dwayne capizzi that guy i mentioned as being you know the guy who said hey i think it's more like the shadow and the green hornet uh, he was Jeff's boss at one point, basically, because he was the producer on that show that Jeff was working on. Wow. So all the circles coming back. Uh, but anyway, I couldn't foresee any of that. The fact that this much in the future that, you know, Darkwing would still be seen in comic form. And of course, it's still being developed as a possible series. So fingers crossed on that one. Man, the Seth Rogen's team is doing that, right? Yeah, and I point out to people, they're the guys, it's uh, Point Grey Pictures. They did Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, the last mm -hmm. movie out. That was so good. I mean, just awesome. 
it was so it's like one of those things that was staring you in the face and nobody saw it that let's write them as if they really are teenagers right. as opposed to superheroes that were just calling teenagers and saying they like pizza a lot um that was brilliant it looked brilliant uh and now the 2d version which i think is is a series coming out late summer mm -hmm. i've seen the trailer online for that that looks great so i'm just hoping look point gray had the taste to steer whoever was the creative team on that into that direction or give the right feedback you know my hope is they're doing the same for uh darkwing goslin and launchpad I would hope so, man, because I need to see it. I thought when they did the uh, the they did the Darkwing cameos in the DuckTales reboot, I was like, oh, it's got to be like right around the corner. Any yeah. day now, they're going to announce this series they've been working on. Well, if those guys had gotten it their way, that's exactly what would have happened. I mm. mean, uh, those guys actually did an entire Darkwing presentation. And then we're told to, oh, we're now going to do something more limited. And they rejiggered it for that. But ultimately, and this is like Disney. Actually, I don't know whether it was Disney Channel Management or Disney Plus Management or, or whatever. But, you know, it was out of there. They were saying, no, we're going to actually put it out there to, to other people. Mm. Um, but yeah, that you and everybody else thought that was going right and long. So whatever they do, okay, again, uh, I haven't seen anything in a long time, but mm. I would, I would be shocked <laughs> to the point of a heart attack if they actually continued what they did in the DuckTales, you know, 2017, mm -hmm. whatever they come up with will be as fresh as the various versions of, you know, the turtles that have you know you can tell that oh they did or it's like the spider-man thing it's like oh yeah. here's the toby spider-mans here's the you know andrew garfield and all of that um you know we'll see this one will start out fresh and they'll make their own ground rules and uh here's hoping and with that hoping what's the one thing that you say is essential to darkwing like if they don't do this then they haven't captured it. I would say the relationship of Darkwing and Goslin, mm. and to a lesser extent, Launchpad, but father and daughter. Um, I know I told this story a lot over the years, but uh, again, I shared a room with Ron Clemens. Glenn Keane came in three months after me, one of the top animators of all time. Mm. Uh, they could go into any movie theater playing Little Mermaid or Aladdin and hear audience reactions. I didn't get, we had ratings that came out much later than air that told us, oh, it's being successful. Somebody's watching it. Mm -hmm. I did not get fan reaction until I retired and was invited as a guest to, you know, a convention. And suddenly people were saying, especially women were coming up and in tears, explaining to me how much that relationship meant to them because they had a rough upbringing with you know, either a dad missing or a dad being abusive or whatever. Mm. Uh, and that happened three times in the same convention, three wow. different people. Um, and then I continued, had stories like that, not as drastic, but just people who said, man, that was, that meant a lot to me. It was mm. that, it was that family at the center. So to me, that's what they need to hold on to. You know, we used to, after the fact, we described it as what if Batman had a little girl who refused to stay home? Mm. You know, if if you've got that, you've got the essence of Darkwing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I'm yeah, I love <laughs> Goslin, especially like in the yeah. in the Dibert series, like that whole bit, even just in just even just in the first issue, where it's like she wants a phone and he's like, No. <laughs> they yeah. go through all of this uh for him to eventually come around, but just Goslin always wanting to leave the nest or prove her independence and <laughs> Drake trying to keep her under his thumb. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's great. And maybe I'm just sentimental because I got daughters, but. Well, you know what? The other thing is Amanda was about nine years old when Darkwing came out. She has a nine-year-old daughter. So mm. for homework, <laughs> she had to watch all the Darkwing. She watched it with her daughter. Mm. So she's tapped into, you know, that parenting part and can, you know, caricature it and have fun with it. I think that came natural to her. Yeah.
for sure. So one last reminder for you guys, go to comicsordope.com slash Darkwing. You can back the Darkwing Duck Kickstarter. You can grab one or more of the trade paperbacks. You can grab the whole set of three. Um, you can move up to the hardcovers or even the limited edition hardcovers. They've unlocked stretch goals. Uh, the campaign crossed 300,000 today. Uh, so they just announced that anybody who orders at the print level will get a free exclusive five by seven acetate animation style cell, um, which now I'm like, I got to get something so I can get this, this cell. <laughs> um, there's already other things coming out. Like there's a, an ash can for a new Darkwing Duck series coming. Um, and I believe you did the cover for that, right? Yeah, I did. So in okay. fact, I do covers for, you know, the whole series. I don't oh, know, they wow. haven't actually announced that, but you know, they announced the ash can. So I'm blowing it. I'm, Man, I'm revealing it, which that's exciting. drove me nuts. Although some of the covers came out really sweet. It was one of those things I finished and went, wow, this worked out. I've been looking at the, um, I think you did some art like for auction. Uh, you posted on your blue sky and I'm like, man, I got to get in on one of these. <laughs> Those are really good, man. Um, so yeah, back the campaign. Um, Ted, thank you so much for your time. I know you've had a long circuit for these interviews, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I really appreciate you talking to us and um, I'm excited about more dark wing coming. So thank you again. Thank you. And stay dangerous. Yes, absolutely. You're going to stay dangerous. Uh, all right. Well, now that I've lost all composure, you guys stay safe, stay awesome, and read something dope today. Peace. <laughs>